you, thank you so much for uh, for that song and uh, for everyone that's been part of our service today. Thank you so much for contributing and and uh, we actually had a little uh, meeting last night even to uh, introduce a few more people to our soundboard and getting them trained. So I appreciate uh, those that are helping out there as well. Uh, time of refreshing. Ah, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Isn't that what you come to church for? You know, you come to church hopefully to get refreshed, right? To get recharged, to get relief, time of refreshing. That's the topic of my message today. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, many prayers have gone up, but at this juncture, Father, I just continue to dwell in your presence and acknowledge your presence here, Lord. Uh, so we continue to dedicate this time to you. Pray that you would speak to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is uh, normally a message I would preach kind of at the beginning of a year, uh, the, at least in topic and tone and, and, and things like that, uh, because it's a good, a good time to, to think about you know renewal and, and refreshment. Um, but as I was uh, preparing and praying, uh, the Lord just kept bringing this back to me, so I, I decided that it must be His, his desire that uh, we discuss this this morning. Um, it, go, it should go without saying that if we're going to be refreshed, at some point we had to be fresh to begin with, right? You know, uh, you can't refresh something that was never fresh to begin with. And I want you just to think about that for a second. Do you remember when it was like, to be fresh, and that can that can mean different things. Think about being maybe fresh in your career. Remember, remember when you started and you just were filled with ambition. You were filled with energy and and vision. Maybe fresh, uh, maybe fresh in a relationship. You remember when your marriage was fresh? I wasn't meant to be something to laugh about, but <laughs> do you remember when your relationships? were fresh? Uh, do you remember when you got that fresh new car? You know, before, be, you know, when it was fresh, coach, you know, it won't be long and it's going to smell like old socks and stale fries. You know that. And it's going to need a refreshing, right? Do you remember when your walk with Jesus was fresh? We all need to go through a period of refreshment, Right? It's something that is essential to our, our lives. And, and uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I, I think that we as a people, as a culture, are in dire need of refreshment from the Lord. I, I, I say that for myself and personally. So let's, let's get into it a little bit. And I know we don't have a lot of young people here, but I still like to interact with the, those that are here. If you would help me out with the uh, beginning part of the, the message here, the kids quiz. And just raise your hand. I'd love to call on you. I, I know we only have a handful. If, if the kids don't want to participate, we'll let uh, the big kids help out. Who's the author? So um, the message is going to come mostly from the book of uh, Acts today. So who's the author of the book of Acts? Do you know? Most of you kids I can call by name. All right, Toby, help us. Oh, Toby. I, sorry, I saw Toby's hand first. Is that all right? Go with it. Yeah, Toby. It is not Matthew, so we're going to go back to the corner here. Who, who wrote that book? Luke, that's right. Luke is the author of the book of Acts. And when you combine Luke's gospel with the book of Acts, that means Luke gives us about one-fourth of the New Testament. And if, um, if you consider uh, the other major author of the New Testament, Paul, they actually Luke actually writes a little bit more than Paul does unless you uh, in include Hebrews. We don't really know. The author of Hebrews never identifies himself, so we, it's often attributed to Paul. It very likely could have been Paul. If Paul did write Hebrews, then Paul inches out Luke a little bit. But if, if, uh, if uh, Paul was not the author of Hebrews, actually Luke would be the greatest contributor to the New Testament. But be, be that as it may, one-fourth, a fourth of our New Testament comes from one individual. And uh, Luke is the guy that does that for us. So that's pretty uh, amazing when you think of it. Number two, why is it called Acts? You know, it's not like it, Luke begins, here, I'd like to write this story, and I'm going to call it Acts. 
Uh, that is a title that has been given to it. What do, what do you think? Is it because it's the Acts of all the Apostles? Uh, because the church said this is, these are the Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the early church? Or Paul plays a pretty big role. Is it the Acts of the Apostle Paul? Maybe all of them? What do you think? Sophia? Oh, what did you say? E, all of the above. You know, I'm not a, a good quiz maker. Almost any time on a test when that option's available, it's usually the right one. So powers of deduction there, I like that. Yeah, so um, historically different uh, traditions have called it acts of different things, but it really is all these things. Ellen White, con in her Conflict of the Ages series, that she writes on the life of the early church calls it Acts of the Apostles. And that's fine, although it's kind of funny because really the apostles aren't involved in it really that much. I mean, Peter initially is there, James and John are in the early story stories, but really by about chapter four or five, most of the apostles um, disappear from the page. Peter's there a little bit, James will speak in, in Acts 15, um, and then Paul becomes the prominent character. So um, yeah, it is Acts of, of the Apostles, sure, the Holy Spirit, is clearly given there in Acts chapter 1. The early church is formed, uh, and Paul plays a big role. So really, it's just it's just the, the acts of all the things that were happening in the early days of the church, including the apostles and, and all those things. All right, this is the last one, and, and we're going to see if you can remember some other Bible characters from the book of Acts, all right, other than the apostles. So uh, let's see if we can remember who they are. Who He was the first Christian martyr. What was his name? Okay, are you pointing at Leah or at Jacob? Yeah, your dad's calling you out here. Or you're pointing, you're pointing this direction, so. <laughs> I see my son's hand up. I know his hand's up, but I'd love to have some others involved. I'm not going to twist any arms here. All right, Toby, what's his name? Stephen is his name. The next one, he was a traveling pal with Paul, and his name means sons of his name means son of encouragement. If you remember back to the sermon on Simon Bar Jonah, you know Bar means son. So traveling companion with Paul, and his name begins with Bar. Oh, I'm really stretching you here. You, you, do you know this one? Is it coming to you? Now your friends are letting you down, aren't they? <laughs> it's not Bartholomew. That's a good good guess. All right, Jacob's got it. He's going to help us out this morning. Barnabas is who it was. She died but was resurrected. Sounds like something worth remembering, someone's resurrection. What was her name? She actually has two names. We used to have a ministry in the church that was named after her, but it uh, is no longer an active thing. You remember who she was? Toby? Dorcas or Tabitha? Dorcas or Tabitha? All right, next one. He preached to the Ethiopian. You remember the story? The Ethiopian was there reading the book of Isaiah, and he was reading out loud, and, and this gentleman came up and said, do you know what you're reading? He said, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he said, perfect, let's talk about it. All right, here in the back. It's Philip, and this is Philip the deacon, not Philip the apostle. This is Philip the deacon. All right, she was the first Christian in Europe. The very first Christian convert in the continent of Europe was this lady. She was a seller of purple. Do you remember? All right, we'll come back here to you. It is Lydia. Yes, Lydia the seller of purple. First Christian in Europe was Lydia. Last one, he was in prison with Paul. Who was in prison with Paul when they, at long about midnight, began to sing, and then all of a sudden the chains rattled off and the, the gates of the, the cell opened wide? All right, you think you got this one? Silas. Silas is his name. Yes, Silas is his name. A lot of great stories from the book of Acts, all other kinds. There's Apollos and Ananias and Sapphira. There's three Ananiases in the book of, uh, of uh, Acts, and uh, John Mark is there, and we've we meet Timothy for the first time. Pretty important stuff. Last week, um, my message came from the book of Exodus, and just so you can 
understand why it's not necessarily a random thing each week. Uh, some pastors may have, you know, and from time to time, the messages don't always, don't always connect. But there is some connective tissue between last week's message, which you all loved and remember in every detail and are just still uh, relishing over. Um, and there's, there is still, uh, there's connection between that last week's message and this. And, and keep in mind that Acts is kind of like the book of Exodus in the New Testament. The stories and the, the events really are similar. Just consider this for a second. In Exodus, you have a group of slaves who decide to follow the deliverer, all right? They go through the Red Sea, which Paul tells us is a symbol of baptism. They form the community. They build the sanctuary. They uphold God's laws. And on their journey to the promised land, they go through many travels and trials, right? In a general sense, that's the same story of the book of Acts. You have a group of sinners, okay, on the day of Pentecost, who decide because of the preaching of Peter to follow the Savior, Jesus. They're baptized, right, which is the going through the waters. And there's baptisms all over the place in the book of Acts, okay? They form a community called the church. They become a sanctuary, all right? They don't, they don't build a sanctuary in a physical structure. They understand that they are now by virtue of their being the community, they are the sanctuary. They uphold God's law, and they too go through travels and trials. And much of the book of Acts is the stories of Paul traveling and his trials and trying to uh, bring the knowledge of salvation to other people. So really, in, in a lot of ways, Acts is the, the New Testament version of Exodus, at least in theme and in development of the story. So there is some tie-ins there. And... Um, uh, I'll, I'll bring out a, a couple more here before the end of the service. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 3 and begin in verse 11. I, I want to share something with you too. It dawned on me uh, just this week. When I first began preaching, I didn't use PowerPoint. But pretty early on, I started to use PowerPoint, and I had a dear church member who hated it. She hated PowerPoint. And she was a beautiful woman, Mark. She was not an evil person. Don't look like that, okay? Be very forgiving. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. She just hated PowerPoint. And um, she said to me, um, Pastor, if, if, if pastors start using PowerPoint, people won't bring their Bibles to church. And I said, no, come on. They won't do that. They'll still bring their Bibles to church. So I just have a question for you. Are you still bringing your Bible to church? And this counts. Oh, I don't even have my cell phone. I guess I can show. My chapstick does not count. Michael's got my cell phone. Oh, Gina's got my cell phone. If you're using your cell phone, that's okay. Um, it's only a little sinful. But your Bible is very important to bring to church. Okay, and uh, so I'm not going to have everything on the screen. Uh, a little bit later, I'll put some of the verse. But Acts chapter 3 and verse 11. This is right after Peter and John healed the lame beggar uh, right outside the temple. Okay, and beginning in verse 11. While the beggar, the, the healed man who just been, you know, uh, he went walking and leaping and praising God. You know the song, okay? Right, at, right after he's healed, it says, While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together together. Uh, to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. They've just witnessed a miracle. This beggar, the Bible says that he had been lame from his mother's womb. So this was not a recent thing. He was, he'd been there forever. He was a recognized part of, if you're going to go to the temple, you're going to pass by the lame guy, right? They knew who he was. So they're full of amazement. Verse 12, when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? And I, I just, I love the audacity of that statement. They just witnessed a miracle, right? Uh, and, and Peter says, what? I don't, what's the big deal? Why are you amazed at this? It's actually uh, a, a bit passive aggressive, a bit sarcastic what Peter is doing here. And he learns this actually from Jesus. Jesus would ask the same question sometimes of just kind of this point blank. You should not be surprised that the power of God is coming to your midst. But anyways, Peter says this. Why are, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we have made him walk? This also shows you that there has been a major conversion in the life of Peter um, and why he could become such a leader in the early church. He does not take any of the honor. He does not say, take a few pictures first, I'll sign some autographs, and then, and then we'll preach. He says, absolutely not. The only thing that you've witnessed here is the work of God. That's the only thing you've seen. Not me, not John. What you have seen is the work of God. He continues on in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. Now, I, I want you to try to get into this story and think about what Peter is saying here and try to think about the tone 
that Peter's using. Okay? This is something that is, is, is uh, missing when we only have, the, obviously, the written text. What tone is he using? And, and notice how blunt he is. The one you delivered, the one you disowned in the presence of that pagan governor Pilate, that Roman uh, 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 tyrant, when he had decided, he decided to release him, but you disowned him. Okay, so Peter is developing a message here. People are amazed. The work of God has come before them, and, and they're amazed at what happened. And Peter said, I need to help you understand what's going on here. And he goes, you remember that Jesus that you disowned? Okay, just keep that in mind and think about the tone. Verse 14, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You are willing to exchange Barabbas, remember that was his name, okay, who you all know uh, was part of a rebellion and, and, and was a murderer. You would rather let him go free and you had the prince of life put to death. Verse 15, but put to death the prince of life. The one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So Peter is not pulling any punches here. In this story, as, as Peter is building up in this message, he's saying, look, what has happened is the power of Jesus Christ has made this man well. And if you want to know who he is, he's the one that you killed. He's the one you rejected. He's the prince of life. You would have rather let a, a murderer go free because you were so angry and filled with hate towards the Messiah. Verse 16, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. So he's now said his peace. He's now said it's Jesus who did it. He is the one who gets all the glory and the credit. And he's the one you rejected. But now verse 17. This, this to me is amazing. Verse 17. And I don't know how many times you read over a passage, and sometimes you pick things up and sometimes you don't. This time, David, I happened to pick it up. Verse 17. And now, brethren. What did Peter just call him? Did you ever think about that before? And now, my brethren. You know, Peter, in his uh, epistles that he writes, he loves to call uh, his recipients beloved. That's his, um, my beloved. Here he just uses brethren. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as the rulers did. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that he's fulfilled, uh, that his Christ would suffer, he's fulfilled. Therefore, return Repent and return. Peter turns on a dime here. When he called some brethren, I couldn't help but think of uh, Les Miserables. Are you familiar with Victor Hugo, the story Les Miserables? Remember when the Bishop of Digny forgives Valjean? Okay, Valjean was an escaped convict, all right? And a, and a kindly abbey, a bishop, takes him in and gives him food and comfort. And in response to that, Valjean steals from him. All right, and, and in Victor Hugo, he beats him as well uh, in the story. He beats the bishop and then flees and then is caught. And he's brought back before the bishop. And the bishop forgives him. And the bishop calls Valjean my brother. And Valjean says it was that reference to him calling me brother that made me reevaluate my life and decide to live a better and honest life. But now... Brethren, there is hope for you. This is something very important to me, and it comes to this whole idea of the time of refreshing. We as a culture and as a people in our brokenness of sin tend to live in two extreme worlds. We either live in the world of, of hyper-judgmentalism, where we can easily see and condemn the sins of others, and, and we, we like to point out the problems of the world and, 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 and point out that, that, that there's challenges over here. Or we live in the world on this side where we tend to uh, ignore the problems of the world and say it's, it's not really a big deal. 
Or, or we live in this world where it's easy to condemn others and want mercy for ourselves, and it's hard for us to give mercy or, or to bring judgment upon ourselves. Peter is able to thread the needle and walk the razor's edge of both calling sin by its right name, but at the same time loving the sinner. Do you see what I'm getting at? He offers them at the, in the same stroke that he says, you are guilty of executing Jesus. You're guilty. You're the ones that did it. And in the same breath, in the same motion, he can just turn on a dime and say, but salvation is available. My brethren, I know you acted in ignorance. Um, oh, there's just so many things that just jump to my mind when, when, when you think about this reality of Peter's ability to acknowledge the condemnation of God that exists on the sinner, but also acknowledge that mercy is available and Christ desperately wants that sinner to repent. But now, brethren, I know you acted in ignorance just as the rulers did, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, he's fulfilled uh, in Christ that he would suffer. Therefore, return and repent. And that's the part I wanted to focus on, and that's where the, our, our phrase, time of refreshing, comes. Rep repent and return so that so that okay notice that repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord and that he may send jesus the the christ appointed to you for you now this is a very peculiar phrase and 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 something that i put a lot of uh, uh prayer and and study into what what is peter specifically and what is luke intending and how he writes uh, this to us today. First, this uh, whole idea of, of refreshing. Just the word refresh. It's just it's just a nice word to say, refresh. You know, it kind of has that onomatopoeia quality to it. You can almost hear the, the fresh breeze blowing when you say it, refresh. Come on, say it with me. Refresh. Doesn't that feel good? It's almost like you take a deep breath, and you feel better just saying it. Refresh. And uh, I don't think things like that are by accident, uh, too. Uh, it, it, it's one of those uh, beautiful realities. Uh, one uh, 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 lexicon says this. It occurs first in the early Hippocratic tractate. Uh, where do we understand the word Hippocratic from? The Hippocratic oath, right? Okay. In the Hippocratic tractate where it denotes the drying out and healing of an open wound, which the surgeon has left exposed to the air when bandaging a broken limb. What was Luke's occupation? Do you remember what Luke did for a living? He was a doctor. Is, there, is it any surprise he would use this, this terminology and word? By the way, he had other words he could have chosen, very similar words, uh, when he chose this Greek word for refreshing. It's actually only found two times in all the Bible, only once in the New, in the New Testament and only once in the Greek Old Testament. He picks this word for a very specific reason, and him as a physician, understanding its medical application and term, chooses it. It's anasuxis, in case you're wondering. Uh, it denotes the drying out and the healing of an open wound. Isn't that a, that's, that's what refreshment is, right? It's when the wound is healed or when, when the, uh, the healing process is being renewed. Uh, another lexicon says this, however, the entire expression may be reconstructed, so to say, so that the Lord may cause you to have relief from trouble or cause you no longer to be troubled. I like that too. Relief from trouble or no longer to be troubled. Do we have trouble in our world right now? Is there a little bit of trouble happening in our country? It seems like there's nothing but trouble. I know that the playoffs are going on right now. There's still things that we can enjoy. I mean, it's not all a wet blanket, okay? But in a larger case, in a, in a more direct way, it seems like that's something we really need as well, relief from our troubles. How many of you, if you were being honest right now, would say in the last week you've had at least some trouble sleeping because of stress? A few of you? How many of you would say in the last week or so you've had at least some stress in relationships because of trouble? Yeah? 
oh, we need this refreshment that we're told about here. We need this relief from trouble. We need this healing of an open wound. It means relief, respite, rest, alleviation, or liberation. Now, the only other place this word occurs, and by the way, um, the New Testament authors were extremely familiar with the Greek Old Testament. That was the Bible of their day, okay, called the Septuagint. That is uh, what they would have known. And, and an educated person like Luke would, would have known exactly and precisely the words that he's using. And I find it very interesting that the only other place this word appears in all of the Bible is in Exodus chapter 8, verse 15. And it's in the story of the plagues. And it's when the uh, Pharaoh says this, when the Pharaoh saw that there was relief, and there's the word, relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Peter, or more precisely we might say, because Luke is taking the words of Peter and putting it in Greek, Luke chooses a word for relief and respite and refreshing that goes back to the Old Testament as a reminder that God still wants to bring relief to people, and we need, we should not be as Pharaoh and harden our hearts when that opportunity comes to us. Notice, too, that he applies uh, Peter uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 3. Well, immediately after talking about the, the time of refreshing and restoration, say this. Uh, I put verse 21. It should have said verse 22. I'm sorry. Moses said, he quotes Moses. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. So he immediately goes to the story of the Exodus and to the words of Moses after he makes this comment about the time of refreshing. So I think that there is a clear uh, uh, application and understanding that the same experience of relief and, rest and restoration that the uh, people were to experience at the time of the Exodus is supposed to be found today in Jesus Christ as well. So here, uh, very quickly, I want to show you what Peter does here to uh, help people understand how they can find refreshment. Before he says, repent and return, he does something else. Okay? He, when the people first ran to him and, and, and were amazed at the healing, G, uh, excuse me, Peter could have just said, uh, this is wonderful, guys. What you need to do right now is you need to repent. But he had to do something first. He had to make sure they saw Jesus for who he was. Right? So the very first step in our finding refreshment, in our finding this, this relief and this alleviation and this healing of an open wound uh, that we want to experience, if we're going to follow what Peter does to us here in Acts chapter 3, is we really need to see Jesus for who he really is. And how are we going to do that? Well, there's lots of ways. I'll suggest to you we need to see him in his word, through his works, and in worshiping him. This is where Jesus reveals himself in the most direct and prominent ways. And notice this relationship between cleansing and the word. John chapter 15 and verse 3. Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. There is a renewing, refreshing, and, and, and reinvigorating experience just through experiencing the word of God. Have you ever had that in your life before? Where through your study of the Bible, through your experience of, of devotions or something, you're you, you just feel that, that God is doing something powerful in your life. Jesus says you're clean. You have experienced cleansing because of the word. In, in, a, in a more spiritual, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. What is sanctification? It's a cleansing of the soul. And in another place in Ephesians, husband, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. So the Word of God is where Christ reveals Himself and brings a refreshing, cleansing experience. The Word of God should be a regular part of our experience, both privately, socially, publicly, coming and participating in the study and uh, uh, and respecting the Word of God. I got an amen out of that. Thank you, Chuck. It should not be any surprise to us that the Bible is a place where we should go regularly to find the revealing character of God. Also, His works, His miracles that He does, 
every single day, recognizing that we are part of his creation, and then in our worship together. What, as I mentioned when I first started the service, isn't what we do here supposed to be a refreshing experience in the presence of God? I think we're doing something wrong if you leave this place feeling burdened. Now, sometimes we need the burden of the Holy Spirit because he's working on our hearts, right? So sometimes that's necessary. But whenever we worship together, there should be a renewal of energy and focus and refreshment. But secondly, we need to repent. Now, you say, well, what does that mean? I mean, I don't really think that I've done anything terrible this week. What, what do I need to repent from? I want you to notice this uh, statement from Review and Herald. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear. The more, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes for your vision will be clear and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature but do not be discouraged i try to uh, emphasize that a lot don't be discouraged this isn't a negative thing this is a blessing this is evidence that satan's delusions have lost their power amen and that the vivifying influence we don't use that word a lot today vivifying doesn't that kind of mean refreshing right? To be revived, the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit of God is arousing you and your indifference and unconcern are passing away. It is impossible for a Christian to say, I'm growing closer to God, but I am not at any more fault today than I was yesterday. It is impossible. It is impossible to grow in our relationship and walk with Jesus Christ and remain the same sinner that we were. It does not work that way. We have not reached our ultimate complete perfection in the light of the character of God. And if we are truly growing, if we are truly progressing, if we are truly being drawn into the loving arms of Jesus deeper and deeper every day, we will not shy away from seeing those faults and we will not deny them. We will say, praise you, God, that you're showing me that in my life I have this issue and now you're going to help me get rid of it. Repent is something we should be doing every single day. And it is the work of the devil. It is the work of the enemy that blinds us to these faults and tries to make us think that you're walking just on your merry way and there's nothing wrong, everything's good, nothing to see here. So yes, if you want a time of refreshing, if you want that open wound to be healed, if you want the alleviation and liberation that comes from knowing that God is working in your life, see Jesus for who he really is. Get to know him through his word, through his works, through the worship that we have together, and as he, through his Holy Spirit, reveals the areas in your life that are still broken and needing refinement, give them to him. Repent. Repent and don't be ashamed. Don't, don't, don't deny. Accept that he is doing a marvelous wonder in your life. And then thirdly, return or turn to God, we could say. Later on in Acts, Paul here speaking to, I think it's Agrippa, he says they should repent, repent and turn to God. It's the same idea. Turn to God, performing deeds appropriate, appropriate to repentance. In other words, if you have repented, then you need to turn from that sin and live in righteousness. Okay? If you've been struggling with uh, gossip and you've acknowledged that and the God has revealed to you, then stay away from those areas that are drawing you into that character assassination practice. Okay? If God has revealed to you that you need to give up alcohol, don't go to the bars anymore. If God has revealed to you that pornography is an evil in your life, then you might need to get rid of the internet. But to continue to dwell in those 
and to continue to expose yourself to those very sinful things that you know are wrong shows that you have not turned. And you've not given serious conviction and commitment to the refreshment that God wants to have in your life. See Jesus for who He is every single day through His Word, through His creation, His works, through the realization of what He's done in your life, through the worship experiences offered in the church and in Bible study groups. Repent as you grow closer to Jesus and He reveals in your life the areas that are weak and broken. And then follow Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul by turning to God and performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Ninth volume of the Testimonies. Our faith at this time must not stop with an assent to or belief in the theory of the third angel's message. We must have the oil of the grace of Christ that will feed the lamp and cause the light of life to shine forth, showing the way to those who, in, who are in darkness. I still love in this, that in this story, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter invites the murderers of Christ as his brethren to become part of the church. Is that amazing to you? That shows that he has experienced the oil of the grace of Christ and the light of the life that would shine forth because he was willing to show the way to those who are in darkness. I just came across one more statement I'll, I want to share with you in closing. This is from the first volume of the Testimonies. I was shown that if God's people make no efforts on their part, but wait for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors, if they depend upon that to cleanse them from their filthiness of flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. Now, I know, I know the temptation of that is, I know when the Lord comes, I'll, I may be struggling now, but when the Lord comes, I know he'll take it from me. You know, I, I know that I have a bad attitude. I, I know that I'm not doing the right thing over here. I know that I've fallen victim to this vice in my life. Uh, but I know when Jesus comes, he's going to take that from me. If we have that attitude and we're not willing to deal with it now, I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem. They will be found wanting. The refreshing or the refreshing or power of God comes only to those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, doing God's work, namely cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. We don't need to wait until we hear the loud cry to experience the refreshing that God wants to have for us. We can have it right now. We can have it today. We can have it now. By faith. Through looking at Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's our Savior. He died for us. He's our example. He loved others. And as we grow close to Him, He shows us how we need to be more like Him and we need to repent and be willing to be honest and then to walk in that life with the power of His Spirit. And friends, that is the only, that's the only way we're going to experience the true refreshing and joy that God wants us to have. It doesn't work to say, oh, I experienced that 20 years ago. It was great. No, he wants us to have it all the time. And that's what made the New Testament church catch fire. Is when people embraced Jesus and repentance and passionate devotion to him. And the world was changed. And we're told that the final work will not be done with less power or wonder than the first work. What do you think God's doing right now? Do you think God's afraid of COVID? Do you think God's afraid of Republicans and Democrats? Do you think God's afraid of the Taliban? Do you want to know what God is afraid of? He's afraid of losing you. 
he's afraid of anyone rejecting his offer of grace. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could spend this time together today. Lord, I know that many clumsy words have been spoken here, but I pray that the power of your word would be what matters. Help us, Father, to bind together. Help us to be students of the book, students of the word. Lord, that's where you reveal your acts. That's where you call us to worship. That's where you tell us the stories of the gospel. God, help us to be confident in these last days that you are still the God of the universe, that you've not forgotten